Good afternoon and welcome to our presentation, Rear Axle Wheel Bearing Replacement Revolution. My name is Andrew Markell. I'm the Director of Content of Babcock's Media's Tech Group and the moderator and presenter for today's event. Today's webinar is sponsored by BCA Bearings by NTN. Today's webinar, we're going to cover rear axles, wheel bearings, and uh, also differentials inside, and we're going to help you give a new perspective on servicing these systems. Next, I'd like to introduce my presenter, presenters from uh, BCA. We're happy to have Divjo Singh with us today. Divjo is an application engineer for NTN Bearings, and he has a special emphasis on heavy-duty truck bearings and the automotive aftermarket. We also have Matt Gorski with us today. He joined NTN back in 2015, and he's the manager of product development and for the automotive aftermarket product lines. And finally, I'd like to welcome Mark Tarrant. Um, he joined NTN in 2017 as an applications engineer for the automotive aftermarket. Um, his engineering experiences goes for the wheel bearing products, validation, and also the testing laboratories. So we have some great resources for you guys. And they also help out a lot on this presentation. So let's go over the goals. Basically, we're going to give you some of the failure scenarios that can happen with the wheel bearing. What noises it's going to make, you know, what other indications that the wheel bearing has failed or other bearings inside the differential. Um, we're going to understand what can be done with an axle. Does it need to be replaced? Or are there special parts out there that can help service that axle to extend its service life? We're going to talk about the special tools you might need to service these bearings. And we're going to discuss some of the different designs out there, like some of the roller bearings, semi-floating and floating um, rear axles. And we're going to talk about also other things that you need to service when you replace a wheel bearing, like the parking brake adjustment and some other parts that are available out on the market that you should include on that parts bill. And we're just going to cover also the bearings that will go into that axle. So let's get started here. So why a solid axle? You know, it's 2021, but we still have vehicles on the road and being manufactured today and into the future that have solid rear axles. Why? Well, first of all, load capacity. Nothing can carry an ac the weight like a solid rear axle. Packaging, because you can't put strut towers in a pickup bed. Also, it's relatively inexpensive for the automaker, and it's also very reliable. I mean, these have been on the roads for well over 100 years, and uh, the design has been refined more and more, and it's very, very reliable. Is it a dying technology? No. Um, simply put, these axles are being used on pickup trucks, both domestically and for import nameplate vehicles. Also, those last mile de delivery vehicles. Just know that every single Amazon van typically has a solid rear axle if it's a Ford Transit. Some of the larger SUVs, some of them are getting away from it, from on the Nissan side, General Motors side, but there are a ton of those out there. And also, for some of the more enthusiast vehicles, the reason why I include this chassis from the brand new Bronco is it does have a live axle rear end. They didn't have a fancy independent rear suspension. They went with a live axle for the rear on this vehicle because the capabilities that it could perform off-road. So what's really changing about these vehicles? Well, we're seeing different packaging, especially of the brakes on the vehicle with torque members and special plates on the end. The parking brakes, um, I saw a recent press release where we're going to have electric parking brakes for that center um, uh, parking brake drum on some of these vehicles, and it's going to be a electric motor that bolts onto the side of the axle. Um, we're also seeing more sophisticated differentials, like electronic locking and even some air lockers, and even better uh, limited slip differentials like some torsions. Um, we're also seeing, you know, the packaging of the bearings change, and we're seeing, you know, greater loads put on these axles, and uh, they're really changing up those designs for more capacity. And most of all, we're seeing a shift. Back in the day, 15, 20 years ago, typically it was a three-channel ABS system with the tone ring or reluctor ring for the rear wheel speed sensors mounted on the uh, the, the rear shaft. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the the rear ring gear. Now, well, most of them have ABS wheel speed sensors at the wheels, and we'll get more into servicing those and what's required. Question about your customers that have these vehicles. you got to understand what kind of loads you're carrying, because typically some of those Ford Transit vans or some of the Sprinters or the 
some of the, the larger ProMasters, um, they're going to be overloading these vehicles, and that can impact the life of the bearings and cause them to be replaced sooner than normal. Also another factor, where do they tow and where do they drive the vehicle? Right now we're getting into summer and most of the people are getting their boats out and you can see a, looks like a Ford F-150 about ready to back into the lake and that nice warm axle is going to hit that water and cool down and cause a vacuum inside the housing. And it might just, if the seals are weak enough, be um, sucking in water into that housing and diminishing the, uh, the gear lubricant. But the big question is how do you know a wheel bearing from a live axle vehicle is going bad? Well, you're going to have to pull up the dial indicator because typically noise, it can give you some indication, but a lot of the wheel bearing failures, it's typically going, the, the noise, it's dampened by such a large assembly. The rear axle housing, the drive shaft, the leaf springs can change the frequency of a grinding wheel bearing to the point where you won't hear it. Um, so it's critical that you're doing these um, checks with in-play, flange run out, and also axle run out, and making sure that that matches the OE specifications. Inspection-wise, a um, couple different methods that, that are used by technicians out there. You can do a running check on a lift. Be very careful doing this. Um, and just listening with either a stethoscope or if you really wanted to get sophisticated, you can do what's known as chassis ears, connecting that to the axle tube to help isolate a noisy bearing from either the wheel or the pinion itself, or also isolating which side the sound is coming from. Um, a test drive is still critical just to duplicate the customer's complaint, because you could wind up solving a complaint that they didn't have and miss the complaint that they do have. The visual inspection. Um, I can't stress this enough. I, as we said before, it's a system. It's not just a, a seal or a bearing. It's a total system with that rear axle, and you have to pay attention to the entire thing. Because something like a breather that may be a 3 or $4 service part can impact the life of the seals and the bearings. It's also critical that you look at the overall condition if it's leaking axle uh, gear lubricant. And this includes out the wheels, and you may have to pull a uh, brake rotor off or a brake drum to see the condition of the seal to make sure it's not leaking onto the brakes. Um, and also, you know, just looking at that breather, making sure that it's functioning properly. Um, another thing that you can really look at is the alignment of the vehicle to make sure that that axle is properly attached to the vehicle because you'll see a lot of issues with uh, damage to the housing that will result in some um, issues with the alignment in terms of thrust angle, even camber on the vehicle, and rear toe. But Probably the one of the most important things to look at when you're inspecting the rear axle is the condition of the drive shaft. You can have an issue with the um, center support bearing or one of the U joints itself that makes life a lot more difficult for the pinion bearings because they're having to deal with different shock loads and other vibrations in the system that could diminish the life of those bearings. Let's talk about doing the complete job. Um, as I stated once before, this is the time to really address the parking brake mechanism uh, because typically if you have a bad axle seal, that parking brake, uh, usually it's that horseshoe typed one that's just one shoe, um, that will become soaked with gear lubricant or gear lube. Um, so now's the time to do it. Looking out there, there are some great options right now, what they're calling a loaded backing plate from some manufacturers out there that have everything on there, adjusted and everything else, so all you have to do is bolt it on. So now is the time to address stuff like that. Make sure you have the correct gear lubricant and then also the correct friction modifier if it does require it. Um, and also, if the axle shaft has issues, you may need to replace it, but we're going to get more into this uh, discussing some of the options you have for bearings and seals that can help solve problems with some of the damages to the axle shaft and the surfaces, the bearings, and also the seal right on. So we got three engineers here. Um, guys, I'm going to throw out a question to you guys. What's the most common uh, bearing that you see for rear axles? Is it a roller bearing, a taper? Um, what do you guys see out there? 
Now, this is Matt Gorski. I'm, I'm going to jump in here, and I'm going to say mostly on the live axles, you're going to see, or I'm sorry, on the solid rear axles, you're going to see a, a cylindrical bearing that is uh, pressed into the axle housing, and that's usually on the the uh, half tons and some three-quarter tons. Um, some SUVs even have them. So I think that's their most popular one that comes in a standard design and a repair bearing design. For some of the heavier stuff, what do you typically see, let's say, on a floating uh, rear axle? Tapered. Tapered roll Tapered. bearings. Mm -hmm. and they're the ones that can generally take more load, so more weight, uh, less chance of them uh, burning up due to overload, because let's be honest, you know, usually everyone with a pickup or a truck um, doesn't necessarily take a look at the load carrying capacity and, and, you know, make sure they're not overloading. Trailers, bricks, sand, whatever you have in the back. Is there any axles out there that use a sealed bearing? A sealed bearing? I, I, I don't, I, none of them come to mind. Um, okay. Not to say that there aren't any. Um, but there are some, not on, not on solid rear axles, typically, no. Now, this is probably a, a critical thing because everybody thinks a solid rear axle or live rear axle, it's, it's very archaic technology, but it's, it's really changing. Um, just about every axle out there, since probably 2008 to 2000, and even going further to 2013, once the government required a lot of rollover mitigation on a lot of these vehicles, they got a tone ring on them. And the tone ring can go a couple different places. Typically, it's the first thing you throw on the axle, and then you throw on a retainer, and then you throw on the bearing, and then you throw on another retainer, but somehow I just forgot the seal to throw that on there. Um, so you're going to see a lot more of those out there. And it is critical that you make sure that the air gap is properly set. Um, guys, what kind of tolerance do they have for installing these tone rings or pressing them onto the shaft? Um, and what could cause a problem with those? Hey, Andrew, this is Mark. Um, the, the tolerances are actually extremely tight. Um, as something as little as like a half of a millimeter can cut the the reading from the ABS or from the wheel speed sensor by seventy to eighty percent. So it, it really needs to be installed uh, at its nominal position. You know, from my experience, it's always been with those wheel speed sensors as they're usually poking out into where you pull the axle out. So I've I've destroyed two wheel speed sensors when I pulled out axles before. My advice, take them out before you start disassembly. And typically, for me now, it's the last thing I install on the vehicle just because I've damaged a few of them before. Um, another thing we're seeing... In differentials is the electronic locking differential. Um, by being able to lock the rear differential, you add some great capabilities to the vehicle for either off-roading or some really adverse um, road conditions by being able to lock up that rear differential. And we're seeing those in, you know, a Titan pickup truck. They have a locking rear differential. Toyota has one. Pretty much all the domestics, it's usually a pretty high option on there but it really adds a lot of capabilities to a vehicle if it's having to go through, like, let's say, a muddy field. And you may have to adjust those when you're rebuilding the differential. Just make sure you're looking at the service information. Another thing that's kind of changing, too, is seals. The materials that a seal is made of have changed quite a bit. Also, um, how the seal and the lip technology has advanced quite a bit, which kind of makes installing those critical um, that you're using the proper tool. Um, a lot of these have issues with you know, making sure it's properly centered, um, that the, uh, the lips of the seal are not damaged or rolled in a certain way, and they have to be orientated properly. If not, you could have issues down the road. So the great example here is of this Ford tool that centers the, uh, the seal itself and then puts it into the axle housing. Sometimes you can get away with a socket, but generally not recommended. Um, and, you know, investment in a good set of uh, seal drivers can, can really pay for itself. And also another thing, since they're using better materials, they typically require better lubricants inside the axle itself.
and make sure you're changing that fluid. If it looks like that, it needs to be changed. I've seen even worse and smelled even worse, I think. <laughs> Um, another issue, if you're seeing a lot of axles out there um, that have gone high miles, um, it's almost normal under normal conditions for where the wheel bearings ride, the rollers, and then also the um, the axle seal to cut small grooves or cause blemishes inside that surface of the axle. And there are several solutions out there um, right now. Probably one of the best options um, I've seen out there is the BCA axle shaft repair bearing. And uh, guys, could you go describe sort of the unitized construction of this? Yeah, this is Matt. Um, I'll jump in here. Yeah, what we've done is we've, you know, gone along with the, the engineering department and repositioned where the roller bearings are going to ride on the axle, or I should say where the axle is going to ride on the, on the cylindrical roller bearings and also reposition where the seal is going to come in contact with the axle shaft itself. So in some cases, you're going to see when you pull the axle shaft out, either you know a worn um, groove, if you will, uh, some rust pitting going on. And in some cases, like you said, you're going to see a little type of a, a groove where the seal has been riding. And you're never going to get a good seal to shaft contact area if you just replace the bearing and replace the seal with the OE design. So our design is pull the seal out, pull the bearing out, drive in the unitized device, and then slide the shaft in. And you're going to see if you take a close look that the shaft is going to ride on, uh, the bearing is going to ride on a new section of shaft, which is going to kind of lift up that axle shaft a little bit and relieve the stress on the seal. And the seal is also going to uh, seat up against uh, fresh part of the axle shaft. Um, of course, it's always recommended that you clean up and take a little emery cloth and clean it all up. And like you said, uh, lubrication is essential. So ours are going to come pre-lubed, and uh, there should be some lubrication on the seal material. But uh, um, you know, just make sure everything is lubed, clean, and driven all the way into the axle shaft completely. And um, it should save you from having to replace an expensive axle shaft. And you don't have to install a sleeve for these over the axle? Nope, not on this, not on this design, no. Let's talk about differential bearings. We, we had a really good spirited discussion in the, uh, the rehearsal on this. And it's definitely a service opportunity. Um, you know, there's four bearings in there, usually two on the pinion, and then one on each side of the differential and the carriers. Um, but the thing I kind of discovered is that the service information for these differs quite a bit, not just from make to make, but from even model to model um, for the recommendations. And so, But we're talking about the general guidelines. Is you can't go in and make random adjustments. You have to really know what you're doing um, if you decide to go after a issue with the differential itself making a lot of noise. And you know, just looking at the the overall, how do you service this? And, and this is what we got discussing about you know the different styles out there, um, how the differential is moved around, also how it, it controls its relationship with the pinion and also the gears, um, and you know just how you know some of the Ford nine inch stuff and how that uh, goes on the vehicle. And we got in this interesting discussion about the service components and what's in a kit for that. Uh, guys, question for you. In general, when you're servicing a pinion and you're sitting in that preload, what parts need to be replaced usually? Well, this is Matt again. Um, you know, of course you're going to get your bearings, but you know, you're going to have shims, you're going to have new bolts, you're going to have a crush sleeve, which is um, kind of right in the middle of those, uh, you know, you got the seal, the crush sleeve, and the nut in the, in the picture, just above the bolts. Um, so yeah, you're going to need to have some dial indicators and inch torque wrenches, and um, everything is very, very precise. The rule of thumb is once you tighten it, don't loosen it back up because a crushed sleeve is not a spring-type material, and it can only uh, provide pretension one way. Um, again, it due to the helical, you know, gear patterns as you drive down the road, it's going to tend to want to, you know, pull or push that that pinion gear in or out of that ring gear, um, depending on the, 
uh, direction you're going. So you're going to see um, a lot of stresses on the pinion uh, bearing and, and that crush sleeve particularly. Um, in some designs, you're going to have a crush sleeve. In some designs, you're going to have spacers. Um, you know, it all depends on the application. Like in the case of the Ford 9-inch, you're also going to have a, a pinion head bearing. So you're going to have, uh, you know, the the inner and outer bearing, then you're going to have a little nub at the end of the, the club of the pinion gear that uh, has its own separate uh, bearing. But um, again, it, it, for most of what you're going to be seeing out there, what you see on the screen there is what you're going to need to replace it. Um, we call this a master kit. We put an MK at the end. So that's going to include the bolts. It's going to include the shims and spacers along with the uh, you know, bearings and races and RTV and gear pattern paste and, and brush. Um, but we, we try and give you everything short of the gear loop to uh, to rebuild, um, give you an assortment of shims. And uh, the only thing that you really need to do is look up a good service manual and what the tolerances are and, and, and how to torque them all down, and you should be good to go. And that kind of goes back to the original slide right there where that pinion failed. And that was done by a technician who didn't make the correct adjustment, and he reused the nut on the uh, the differential to set the preload. It came loose, and it just kept on going back and forth and hitting the uh, the uh, carrier for the differential. So critical that you use all the parts necessary. So let's get some application-specific stuff. Let's talk about the 2015, which is pretty much any F-150, probably from the past 20 years, uses this style of um, rear differential. Typically, the axles are held in both with a retaining washer and uh, also it uses a pin that must be removed to get the rear axles out to service the bearing. Another thing to service tip that Ford is quite emphatic about in their service uh, information is making sure that bearing is pre-lubricated and also the seal itself when you press it into the axle tube. This is their light duty, um, it was about a three quarter ton pickup truck. But once you start getting into some of the F-250, 350, 450, there's actually the bearing, the roller bearing, you start getting into, uh, actually, let me go back here for a sec here. Um, but that's the bearing, it's a roller bearing and they do have um, an axle saver kit for that. But once you start getting into the 250, 350, 450, you get a full floating hub in the back and a full floating axle. Um, these can support quite a bit of weight. Um, servicing them, it can get a little difficult once you try to get those outer races out of the hub itself. Um, removing the axle is typically done with um, the eight bolts that are around that hold the axle in, and typically it'll come right out. Um, with these, it's critical that you take proper care with the bearings that you're installing, um, that the outer races are properly seated, um, and that you're using, again, the correct gear lubricant, because that's what it uses inside the axle to lubricate these. Also, setting the preload is critical that you have the right tool. That's um, typically a socket that has a couple uh, stub sticking out to adjust it properly, and um, depending on it's typically a Dana rear axle, you want to look up the uh, the preload um, in the service information because it can change from year to year and according to axle size. The Nissan Titan. This is actually a pretty popular uh, pickup truck lately because it's also the NV, which is their delivery van. Um, been seeing a lot more of these on the road. Uh, with this, it's a um, roller type bearing that is pressed onto the axle and held in place with a few retainers. With this, you may have to remove the reluctor or tone ring for the axle itself. Um, these are kind of known for um, some common things that can happen to the axle itself. Uh, the flange will start to develop run out, and also the axle itself will start to have run out. And even on these, sometimes you can have issues with the sealing surfaces onside the uh, axle um, where the seal, the replacement seal, will not properly seat or there's a groove cut into it. So it's critical that that's addressed. Um, with this one, this is the one I kind of made the mistake of leaving the wheel speed sensor in there and pulling and installing the axle. 
with it in the tube. So make sure that you're servicing those and making sure everything works properly and go for a test drive afterwards. And there is the bearing set itself. So it also includes a retainer that is typically cut off when you um, remove the old bearing. And the seal itself, make sure you're ordering those. I, guys, I've got a question for you. With seals for bearings, when you're ordering a, a, the bearings to service a, a rear axle, is it t difficult to get a kit that both has the bearing and the seal? And Because I, I noticed in the catalog that you the seal typically comes separate. Is that just a, a cataloging thing of where you may have one bearing that fits a bunch of different axles, but the the uh, the seal could be specific to a housing? Well, this is Matt again. Um, we've had a couple cases where we've done some tests where we've included some seals, um, and some of the feedback that we've had from the field is they have a real preference on, on which seal that they want to use. Some people prefer one brand over the other, so they didn't see the value in, in including it um, with it. So it's something that we're open to. It's something that there's been some pushback from, from our customers on, um, and they didn't really see it as a, as a real um, serious value add because a lot of people e either had their own seal, didn't want to use the seal that came with it, what, whatever reason it is. But, um, um, it, it is something that, that we're still uh, open to hearing back from different customers. Um, there is some, like you said, there's some cases where you could have this bearing that fits 17 makes and models, but of those 17 makes and models, there could be three different seals depending on the, the other dimensions of the axle housing. I mean, it could be a Dana 30, Dana 25. Uh, you know, Dana 50 and 60 use the same type of bearings, but not the same seals. So sometimes it is a cataloging thing where we would have to put two or three different seals in there with instructions on which ones to use and which axle. So it, it can be complicated, and it could be something as far as preference of seal supplier. So the next one, Toyota Tundra 2014 and up. The reason why I included this, it's kind of a different design than what we've been used to and talking about previously with the Ford F-150, the Titan, and uh, this one actually uses a rear hub and bearing assembly. So essentially what you have is that. Um, it looks sort of like a hub unit that you bolt onto the axle and then you do your reassembly of the, the brake backing plate, uh, the flanges, but there is a retainer that you do have to install on the axle itself to hold that in place, and then you bolt it on the vehicle. Um, with these, kind of a neat thing. It's got an ABS sensor built into it, so when you do replace this bearing, if you're dealing with something rusty, like I typically have to deal up here in Ohio and maybe even Chicago where BCA is located, um, you may wind up damaging the wheel speed sensor trying to pull it out because um, these are made of steel. But the good old Jeep Wrangler JK, I think this one runs up until like 2017 when they changed some of the suspension design. I don't know how similar that is to the JK. I'm trying to remember what, which one that is. Sorry, not a Jeep person. Um, technically, this is called a semi-floating design. And with this, you have a quite stout retainer that holds the bearing onto the axle itself. So with this design, uh, you do have to pull the axle. Um, do the assembly with the different uh, retainers on there. Um, typically, the, uh, the ABS tone ring stays on the axle in uh, most cases. And uh, just make sure that you properly install um, this bearing on there. And try using a press. Um, there's quite a bit of guys out there that tried the pipe method of pounding it on there with a, either a jack handle that fits perfectly around the, um, the retainer itself to get that down onto the axle. But, you're better off uh, both time-wise and uh, making sure the job's right, done right the first time by using a press. Tips. Um, just talking about just general tips that apply to all these vehicles out there. Um, I can't stress this enough, but um, investing in the correct tools. Um, again, don't improvise tools or sockets. Um, there are some really nice slide hammers out there, uh, seal drivers. Um, bearing press tools um, that make the job easier and save you a whole lot of time. Um, again, always look at the surfaces of the axle to make sure that they're properly um, able to work for the next set of bearings and there's no grooves or other things cut into them and there's 
just know there's replacement parts out there that can help extend the life of that part. So and also replacing the gear lubricant because that's typically what lubricates the bearing. And again, with a lot of these applications, if you're dealing with a fleet customer, a Ford F-250 or anything with a floating axle, you want to make sure that you're using a high quality bearing. Um, again, pay attention to the ABS wheel speed sensors. Um, also, if you want to either take a picture or make a note of the location of the tonering, um, and just make sure that it's properly positioned when you put the axle back in the vehicle. Um, never reuse parts, and this especially goes for a lot of the older Toyota applications where you have the flange plate that holds in the bearing, and it can get rather rusty, or you know the fasteners and some of them don't look right. Um, you need to really pay attention to those. Also, once you get that vehicle um, done and you're dealing with another customer that may, another comeback after the bearing has failed, you need to check out the condition of the axle housing. And this is typically where an alignment system can really help looking at the overall thrust angle of the vehicle. And even an indication of camber on one side of the axle is typically, you know, anything outside of zero or, you know, even one degree uh, can indicate damage to the axle housing. So pay attention to those when you're servicing a vehicle or post-service or doing a diagnosis why one failed prematurely and a alignment rack can really uh, help you out with this. So that's our presentation. We're going to go into the Q&A here in just a second. Um, you're going to see a survey pop up right up in front of you. Please fill out that survey because that's going to help us direct future content for these webinars. And uh, let's go through some of your questions right now that we had come up. Okay, we have a, an interesting um, Travis here was wondering about uh, some of the Toyota seals with seals on both sides. Um, I typically want to say that's a Tacoma um, type axle. Guys, do you have any ideas? Yeah, I, this is Matt again. I think what he's talking about is the bearing modules, the ones with the, the bolts, the four bolts that bolted on. And there are some cases where um, they are sealed um, on both sides. Um, so there is no axle lube uh, coming from the differential housing that's going to lubricate that that uh, bearing assembly. So there are a few of those. Some of those are open, so there is some gear lube that goes and and feeds and and lubricates the uh, the bearing from the axle lube assembly. But um, you know those do come in uh, both ball and paper designs. But uh, those would be considered uh, a sealed type if there is a seal on both sides. Here's a great question. Um, if I'm re reinstalling a bearing and it's not fitting inside the axle shaft, could the issue be the housing or the bearing? Well, that's another great question. We get that quite a bit, when, especially when we're uh, dealing with the, uh, with the uh, repair bearings. Um, the question is how far do you drive the, the 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 bearing housing in and since it's not the typical conrad uh bearing like the oe design some people aren't sure how far to drive it in and so in some cases we'll get calls saying hey i can't get the axle shaft in far enough to engage the c-clip um what's going on so in some cases when they remove the, the bearing from the housing and take a look at the inside diameter of the housing that the bearing is going to be pressed into. You can get rust ridges, you can get debris, you can get little burrs. So I always uh, suggest that people take a look at the uh, bore that the bearing is going to be pressed into and make sure there is no obstructions, there's no rust pockets, and use some emery cloth and some good gear assembly lube to um, you know, help lubricate when you're driving that thing in. And what I can tell you is they're designed to drive all the way in until you cannot drive it in any further. And you generally are going to feel and hear a different tone when you're using a, a bearing driver to drive that in. It's going to you know, get to a deeper thud when you know that it's been driven all the way home. Um, so that's, you know, I think, the answer to the question that, uh, that he's asked. Sort of another, this is kind of an interesting question. I think it's from one of our student attendees. Um, so if you notice problems with an axle shaft or even bearing on one side, and the other side looks good, should you replace both axle shafts on the vehicle? 
Again, I would say no, they're independent of each other. They aren't, uh, there's no MAP guidelines to replacement pairs. Um, you know, one side may have been repaired, you know, years ago, so it isn't showing the amount of wear that the other side has. So the answer is no, you service these bearings and seals um, side by side. They, they aren't recommended or required to be done in pairs. Okay, looks like we're getting to the end of our time here. I think we have time maybe for one or two more questions. Um, okay, this is a great question. Um, so a damage center support bearing, um, can it damage the differential? Does that need to be inspected um, along with other components on the drive shaft? Um, yeah, absolutely. Anything that's going to have a, a direct relation to the to the differential, whether it be a bad U joint, a, a hanger bearing, differential carrier bearing, um, it could be something as simple as as a, a wheel and tire out of balance, which is causing uh, uneven or undue uh, loads being uh, applied to the bearings, the the ring and pinion gear, you know, the shims. Anything in there is designed to have smooth, even force applied to it and anything that's banging around or out of balance is going to prematurely damage uh, the, the interior. Okay. Hey, this is a, a, a question. Um, this one actually comes from Daniel. He says, are you offering uh, kits such as front wheel bearings on a Toyota Tundra, which might have a snap ring, crush washer, and lock nut seals? Um, Best advice, go to bcabearings.com and look at the catalog for that particular year make model. Um, so I know this Tundra's change up a little bit depending on what options are ordered on it. Um, they have a catalog search, which is the find a part button up in the left hand, uh, I'm sorry, right hand corner. And that should be able to answer your questions there, uh, Daniel. Great catalog online. And I think we have time for one more question. And this kind of goes out to the engineers, and I think this will, is a great way to end this uh, webinar. So what differentiates BCA bearings from the competitors? Hey, Andrew, this is Mark. Um, well, the big thing to keep in mind is NTN, our parent company, is the largest OEM supplier of real hubs in the market. So we approach our aftermarket wheel bearings in the same way we approach the OEM wheel bearings. And the, the key to that is just quality and top grade materials and precision engineering. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, and we, we do do testing. We make sure that the hardness is there, um, the durability is there. It isn't just uh, purchased off of a spreadsheet or, or batch bought. Um, these are things that we're gonna be either engineering ourselves or uh, severely testing both metallurgically and dynamically on, on test equipment in our, in our lab. So it is something that we take great pride in. It takes a lot of time and, and money and effort. We've got a team of engineers that review this and um, it, we, we take it seriously from the OE side and the aftermarket, like Mark said. Well, guys, it looks like we're at the end of our time. Um, I'd just like to thank our, our, our three engineers we had on the line today. This has been great. And I'd like to also thank uh, BCA Bearings made by NTN. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank you, the audience, for attending this. So thank you guys, and have a wonderful day.